has done marvelous, he has done marvelous things. Praise the Lord, he has done marvelous, marvelous, he has marvelous, done marvelous things. Praise the Lord. Oh.
somebody came to worship today. Yes, sir. It's a blessing when, when people are going all according to their own agendas and people are going according to their own will. You still have people who are accustomed to tuning into the will of God. Even on this morning, we thank God for you joining us either in person or in this virtual vessel, cyber sanctuary. We thank God for you. Thank God for this awesome music ministry. I just Thank feel it yeah. every Sunday. Yeah. I want to keep in prayer those who are traveling, those who are away from us. Minister, you know, I'll be Gilbert as he's away. Keep him in prayer uh, as his spirit is being recharged as well. I want to pray for those who are going in and out of hospitals, those people who are at home sick. I want to just keep them lifted and encouraged in prayer because it's not so much about what you say. Sometimes it's just about being there with someone who's going through their storm. I want to give to you a word this morning that's couched within the first psalm. Thank those who have led us in worship thus far with the flowers reading Psalm 31. I want to read verse number one through six of Psalm chapter number one. Psalm chapter number one. We are blessed and impressed to be in the house of God this morning. Hearing a reading from Psalm chapter number one, verse number one through six. I have a propensity to read from the NIV version. Your Bible should say the same message. The text says this. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. But whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law both day and night. That person, hear me, is a person like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Verse number four, not so the wicked. They are like chaff. The wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, 
nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Yeah. The word of God for the people of God. The people of God said thanks be to God. If you'll indulge me this morning, I just want to tag this text in our exchange and preach from the subject, flourishing faith. Flourishing faith. Turn to your neighbor if you could, underneath the sound of your breath. I know it's COVID season and we're trying to make sure that we're healthy. Amen. Somebody just say, you better have some flourishing faith. If you don't want to speak to them, just nudge them and say, have some flourishing faith. The song is chapter number one. The beginning of the Psalter. The collection of songs. Matter of fact, books of songs are like the people of God's praise handbook. It's almost as if people had these red hymn books and they were praising God with them. Matter of fact, sometimes the, the worship leader will memorize the psalms and so they would recite them and cant them to the other congregants. What you see here, there are some psalms that give high praise to God. Those are the Hallel songs. There are some songs that give lament. That is the, the, the prayer songs. There are some songs that encourage you in your Christian journey. That we can even take today because those things that are written for time were written for our learning. That by patience through the scriptures, we might have hope. It's to say that those things in the Old Testament sometimes were written for our maturity. Here we find psalm that is to encourage and empower us. Psalm chapter number one is just like Psalm chapter number 31, in that David is writing to God, and writing to the people in which he will be, uh, be the auditor of the words in which he's saying. He's saying precisely that you have to be someone who is maturing in your walk with God. Not only do you ask God for things, not only do you ask God for, for tangible things, not only do you ask God to be with you, but here it is, you have to ask God to be better than you were the last day. Yes, psalm 31 shows us that David is writing a song of thanksgiving and encouragement because God has not given him over to his enemies. Right. Now, I think some of y'all think enemies always have to be people. Enemies don't always have to be people. Enemies can be the circumstances, the systems, and the society that oppress and try to trip you up. Sometimes the enemy is not just other people. It's the inner me. Sometimes the enemy is those things that we go along every single week trying to deal with. David says, you haven't given me over to the things that have been trying to take me out. Poet, Seal Clifton, once said, come celebrate with me. That every single day something has tried to take me out, but it's failed. I don't know if y'all know that, but that was, a, that was a reconstruction. That was a renaissance poet who said, sometimes you got to just praise and celebrate because the thing that I've tried to take you out and your family out has failed. And I wish I had somebody today who could praise God just for that reason. Sometimes you need not to look for God in the miraculous things. You've got to make sure that you praise God for the preventative things. That could have happened. It was Dr. Irvin D. Seamster of the Bible World Church in Dallas who taught me a long time ago to make visits to the sick in the hospital. During those visits and those times interning with him for a year and a half, I realized that some people could not have the opportunity to come into the house of God. And it really hit and pricked my spirit because I realized that I was someone who would come into the house of God at will. I was someone who could move and walk, get in my car to drive on the highway, come and lift my hands. But I, I met someone at their bedside at the Parkland Hospital in Dallas and they had a paralysis. Reminded me of my grandfather. My grandfather I never got to meet because uh, he had Hodgson's lymphoma. He passed away when he was early in his life, about 50 years old. And he was paralyzed. He couldn't even come into worship without a wheelchair. And I realized, I began to think, as I was encouraging this person on their sickbed, that I was encouraged because I was able 
by God to come to the house of God. I don't know what you may be looking for. I don't know what praise is your 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 forte, but I want to let you know that you don't have to look for God in the stuff that He gives you. You gotta rear back your head sometimes. You gotta lift up your hands. Sometimes tears ought to flow. Your feet ought to be lit. You're moving it. You gotta make sure you praise God because God didn't give it to you to just sit here and worship with your arms folded, acting as if God is the one that owes you something. And sometimes we have to understand that God. It's the one who is preventing us from getting in the points where, where people have been. And sometimes we've got to praise God because he stops himself from happening. So our spirit, our posture in worship should just be reflective, meditative. And here it is, thankful, because we have this time in devotion. Psalm chapter number one talks about a man, a person, a woman who is devoted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Verse number one says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, nor stand in the way that sinners take, or uh, sit in the company of mockers. Y'all do know what mockers are. You need just to look over your shoulder back into your past in school when you used to get bullied or when people used to make fun of you or people used to have you proved some things to them. Yeah, yeah. Psalmist declares that this person is blessed because he does not stay around toxic circles. Right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, he doesn't stay around those who, who ridicule, who, who have mockery, who have contentment in their hearts. Yeah. Matter of fact, these are the people who refuse to join the wrong circles. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You all know what scornfulness is. It's, it's when someone expresses hate or even some toxic nature to other people. These people are proud. They're violent. They're, they're arrogant. Who, who scoff at the way of peace and mock goodness. These are the people who try to tempt God. These are the people who try to have you prove yourself to them knowing that you will never even attain what they're trying to make you prove to them because they just want to see you do something. Scornful is that, that crowd that Jesus was doing ministry in the first century. They were trying to see a miracle after miracle, but they didn't have any interest to believe in who he was. The scornful are those people who try to take advantage of you. I, I'm talking to somebody today. Those people are the leeches of life who try to just suck the life out of you without investing in you. I wish I had somebody today who knew that this circle of people is someone you don't want to be around. Psalmist so says the person who is not around that type of circle is blessed. Now this word, blessed, let me do some unpacking and heavy lifting as I teach. This word, blessed, translated in the Septuagint in Greek, it is called Makarios, Makarios, which means a favor. It means a, a blessed happiness that comes from God. It shows us that only God can provide some modes of happiness in our lives. As a matter of fact, you're more happy when other people who are trying to leech from you are away from you. Let me, let me serve an eviction notice to some of y'all's circles because. You're only around people who try to take from you. You're around people, and you're the smartest one in the group. You're around people, and, and, and you're the most astute person in the group. Sometimes, as one writer once said, you have to be sometimes uh, the less, or even in the mid-pack of the group, because if you're the best in the group, everybody is using you. But you see this, the psalmist, contra he really comparatively shows us two different circles. Right. The way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. Right. Now anybody who loves to listen to wisdom at church should understand this. Because we don't come in here just to be entertained. We don't come in here just to admonish each other. But we come here to be admonished. Right. We come here to be taught. And so someone who is astute would appreciate this. That when you are away from the mockers, when you are away from the way that sinners take, 
when you are not in step with the wicked, that's when you see that God is really blessing you with perspective. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because verse number two says, their delight is in the law of the Lord. And they meditate on a day and night. Yes, sir. Beloved, about two years ago, I remember I was uh, trying to navigate a group of circle with preachers, and sometimes preachers can be among the worst. Uh, and I realized uh, this circle was not for me. Yeah, they, they saw some talent, they saw some gifts, and they were like, you know, come hang out with us, play golf with us sometimes, the Jones. You know, we'll, we'll navigate some things. And, um, but I noticed that this group was not conducive to my calling. And it's a pressure because you feel as if if you don't join a circle or a clique of friends, then you won't have clout. Sometimes God has to reveal some people to you. Not to say that you should hate them or hate on them, it's just that sometimes healthy separation is what you need. Same circle of friends you had 20 years ago sometimes should shift from present day because you're growing, you're, you're maturing, you're growing deeper into the Word of God. So, this person that the psalmist paints this picture of is someone who's growing deeper into the Word of God, whose delight is in the law of the Lord. This reminds me of Psalm 37, verse number 4 through 5. You read it on your own time, it says, Take delight in the Lord. And he will give you the desires of your heart. Yeah. Commit your way to him, trust in him, and he will do this. Yeah. You make your righteousness grow like the morning sun and your vindication come. Here it is. Sometimes God can do so much with where you are. But God has to separate you from where you are sometimes uh, so that he can bless you in your fullest potential. This person will not be blessed person would not be pronounced favored by God or happy unless he was separated from some folk. Uh, it shows us a brilliant leadership principle. Several years ago, when I first got here at the Heights, Brother Kathy, he, he shared with me this book on leadership uh, by John Maxwell. It's a leader, leadership book, and it's like a devotion every single day. And I love what it said because on this particular passage, it shows us that God cares about leadership. That your leadership has a lid on it. Yeah, people that you're around, you'll grow from their influence. But here it is, people grow from your influence. And so it's all about what we're being poured into. And this psalm is interesting because it shows us that the leader begins to browse the wrong counsel. To be a good leader, you gotta have some good counsel. To be a person who is sent from God, you gotta be good counsel. Uh, because if you begin to listen to the wrong voices, you begin to tune out the voice of God in your life. But here it is, once you tune into the voice of God, not only does the psalmist say you'll get stability, you'll get durability, but you'll get productivity. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's one of those principles for you this morning. Not only do you get stability, durability, but productivity. Verse number three, it says, look in your Bible, it says, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, yeah. and whose leaf does not wither. Do you all know that an oak tree takes 15 years to become what it is? Yeah. But they can last for centuries. Right. Yeah. I was in the Holy Land about uh, three years ago, and I realized when I was at the Garden of Gethsemane that some of the trees in the garden had been there for 500 years. Right. Matter of fact, they had inscriptions when they first plant the tree yeah. on the date in which it's there. Right. And although they've been there for centuries, they still look like they just have been planted. Right. But it takes 15 years for them to grow to their size. Right. Right. Love it. I want to do something like Leonardo D. Gilbert does. Come close. If you've ever been watching this conversation, come close. Even the camera sits across. Come close. What I have here in my hand is an acorn. It's a shell of a seed. It's a shell of a 
and what you can grow from. Uh, I got this acorn, not because I love nature so much, but because I was cutting down a tree at my house. Now, some of y'all think preachers don't do manual labor. I should let you know that's I do manual labor. Uh, you can you ask Brittany out in the testament. I was trying to get down a tree at my house because uh, it, it had blossomed too big. Right. Entirely too big. It, it, it really dwarfed the place. Right. So I was trying to cut it down. I thought it would just take a saw. I got a little saw. And about three minutes into it, the saw got stuck in the tree. So I tried to rise it out. That thing broke. That, that, that saw made of wood, that, that saw made of metal still broke on me. And I was depressed. I was like, man, I don't know how I'm going to get this thing down. I can't just leave it here because it's, it's not even, I'm not done with it. I, mean, I need to finish this task. And so I went to Menards and they got an axe. They got an axe. And I tried to chop that thing down with all the wisdom of YouTube. I tried to, I tried to know what direction it hit in so it didn't fall on the blade. Say then somebody, I was trying to protect my insurance, but got the event. And, uh, and that didn't work. The axe didn't stick. It didn't, it didn't cut the way I, I wanted it to. At, at that rate, I probably would have been still cutting right now. So I went to Menards again. No lie, I'm telling you. I got on the street, so I'm telling you. I went to Menards and got an electric saw. Apparently, they don't have chainsaws at Menards. <laughs> so what store is this? I need a manly store. I need to go somewhere where I can get my tools. <laughs> well, I settled for an electric saw. I began mowing on that thing. To my knowledge and unbeknownst to me, that thing still didn't cut right either. <laughs> but it was it. And I began to realize how powerful trees are. <laughs> that sometimes you can approach it with iron, steel, and metals, but sometimes that thing will not cut down. And I believe God is calling us to be people like trees. That even though weapons may be formed against you, things will not prosper. And although you may bend, you will not break. I wish I was talking to somebody that was rooted, that was planted, that was in a solid place of stability, like a tree. Trees are actually powerful, strong. Yeah. I've been there long before I was here. But that this is a coordinated spiritual principle. It's like a modern day parable to me. It was an epiphany because I realized when I was reading the text, I was preparing for this sermon about three weeks ago, that the text did not say that they're just a tree. Please catch the nuance in the text. Look at your Bible. Verse number three just does not say that it's a tree. It's, it's a tree that's planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in season. Yes, sir. 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 Not only is a tree powerful, not only is a tree firmly planted and rooted, but scholars have said that when a tree is by water, yes, sir. not only is it nourished, not only will it have productivity, but it will have durability. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's to say, when you have a source, you will always be fed and not on the And many times we like to find our answer in the resource yeah. and not the source. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We like to think of the resources as being the source. But God says, I am the water of life. I am the resurrection and the life. No man cometh to me. Uh, so, so if Jesus is our water, if Jesus is our source, that means if we're planted by the word of God, the word made flesh, because you do know that John says in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and 
the same was in the beginning with God, and nothing was made by him, but by him that was had been made. And so if Jesus is our source, if Jesus is our water, that means that you're planted, rooted, and firmly solid in Jesus. That means when things come against you, nothing will be able to take you down. Text didn't just say that you have to be productive and durable. The text says that if you are by Jesus, if you are by the word of God reflecting day and night, that is to say that you are going to be fruitful. The text says its fruit is yielded in season, whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do. Prosperous. I may have to write a book about my tree chronicles. Because <laughs> there's another tree I have to tell you about. There's a tree I couldn't get down. It took a while. And there was another tree across the street uh, that's shedding. It's a, it's a tree that's going almost albino. I've never seen a tree like it. Uh, it it's dying, but it's still doing it gracefully. It's withering away, but it's still planted. Right. 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 We need more people. Even though we may be going through some seasons in life that are unspeakable. Right. Even though we may be going through some seasons in life where people may not understand or we don't have the adequate words to describe how we're feeling in this season. People come and talk to you and say, how are you doing? You say, bless and highly favored, but you really on the inside don't know how to articulate what you're going through. In those seasons of time, you've got to be like a tree that even though you're going through some stuff and weapons are being formed against you, you are still doing the season in grace. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's the word blessed. That's, the, that's where the word blessed comes from. It's a form from the root word in Hebrew, the word grace or a manifestation of the favor of God upon your life. So, not only does verse number 1 through 2 point to the activity that a person has when they avoid toxic people, they are described as happy and content without the toxic things in their lives, but verse number 3 through 4 shows us the prosperity and the state of life that comes when you value the Word of God as a whole of your life. Not a part of your life, but a whole of your life. When you let the Word of God direct every single word out of your mouth, when you let the word of God direct every single thought that you have, when you have the word of God directing every single prayer that you have, that is when it becomes a moment where God deposits some prosperity in your life. Right. Look at this, verse number 5 through 6. It points to the opposite side of the spectrum. It points to the opposite side of the point. A person will not be blessed if they are with the wrong crowd. Right. Do you all know that your vibe is affected by your tribe? Yes, sir. Your, your tribe affects your vibe. The people you hang with. The people you listen to. The things that you watch. They pass your vibe. So sometimes what we may not need to do is watch The Real Housewives of Atlanta. Sometimes we need to not watch This Is Us. Sometimes we need to not watch all the messy stuff on social media. Sometimes we should guard our heart like the song, like the song says, to, to make sure that God is depositing the right things in our spirit. Not only does it talk about the roots of the righteous and flourishing faith, but it shows us those people who are caught up with the wrong crowd. Verse number five says, therefore, the wicked will not stand in judgment or sinners in the assembly of the righteous. The Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. When you seek after God, there are some things God will allow you to go through that is unlike other people. You have calmness about you. You have people around you. You have the resources and the source guiding you. If you're with the wicked, sometimes those things are absent from you. The text says something very interesting. It says, he describes the wicked as chaff. It's being blown away. Not too long ago, I was 
in Mexico, I got invited to preach in this village when I was living in Houston at the time. And one of my translators was a brother, he was an elder actually at the church of Garden Oaks. He would come with me, bilingual, and we would go to these villages in Mexico. And I was, I was so grateful to get back to the States because I know about the cartels and all the other violence that happens out there with the wickedness of this world. And as I was trying, you know, I was, I was going through this uh, period of time when I was preparing for my sermon, he was, you know, navigating with me some moments and meetings so he could translate accurately what I was going to say before I said it and the concepts in which I was going to give. Uh, he showed me something interesting. We were looking around, and we're in a small village, mind you. Goats and pigs were going right before our eyes. We, we saw somebody getting getting a, a board, and were getting grain, and they were flipping it, just like a spatula, flipping grain, flipping grain, flipping wheat. I said, what is he doing over there? I said, he's separating the wheat from the chaff. And this is a picture of what the New Testament says that Jesus will do on the day of the Lord. Right? If you've been joining us in Wednesday Night Bible class, we've been talking about the Bema of God. It shows us that Jesus did not take kindly to the way of the wicked. Right. You may think that someone is prospering because they got what they got in a bad way. Yeah. You may think that someone is prospering even though they did it unethically and, and they're still not having an accountability. Yeah. God says to the person of Jesus that he will come to separate those who are weak and chaff. Yeah. Yeah. The process was that they would flip it up in the air. This board had small little holes in it. And only the good things would drop down. The bad things would not be able to fit through the small holes on the board. I don't know if y'all are Bible reading church or not, but it reminds me that open is the gate. Uh, open is the gate. God wants everybody to be saved. Everybody uh, should want to be saved. Sometimes narrow is the way for salvation. That's to say that if God has pro proclaimed that you should be saved, you should make sure that you are doing everything that you can to make sure that nobody is blocking, eclipsing, or being a hurdle in your way for salvation. Because only those people make it. The small, particular area will make it in. Because if salvation was easy, everyone would do it. Everyone would go on this journey of discipleship. Everybody would come proclaim the word of God. Some people are more interested in what they have to do after church. Yes, yeah. like, let, me let me preach a little bit. Somebody, somebody in here is more interested. You're already, your mind is already thinking about what you're going to do after you leave here. Your mind is already thinking about what you're going to do this weekend. God says, if it was easy, everyone would do it. Right. And if greatness was easy, everyone would be great. Right. Here it is. You've got to understand that salvation is a process. Yeah. And even in this text, as I take my seat, the Bible says that the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. Right. But the way of the wicked leads to destruction. To understand the power of God. The power of God is that He can protect you, He can cover you, He can direct you. Amen. But you got to give Him your will, you got to give Him your heart. Right. Because He's not going to force you or manipulate you, He's not going to try to string you along without you having your will in the right place. Right. Somebody today needs to align their will with God, stop aligning their will with their friends. Right. You stop aligning your will with your job and align your will with God. You need to stop aligning your will with your vision and dreams when they do not match up to the will of God and align and tune yourself with God. Sometimes God is not so much interested in the things that we are interested in if they don't match up to the will of God. And you can tell a lot if your heart is in the right place. Yeah, if God approves of your will and will align it with his will. 
But the text says that the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. The way of the wicked leads to destruction. Don't you see the, the sharp contrast here? That God has some skin in the game with those who are righteous. Yes, right. And he leaves those who are wicked to their own way. Right. Seeing the righteous forsaken. I haven't seen his seed begging for bread. Amen. David said, I haven't seen the righteous begging for bread. I haven't seen the righteous left to their own way. Amen. There's a certain privilege that comes when you are a child of God. Right. There's a certain privilege when you align yourself to the word of God. Today, I want somebody to understand it's not so much about what you have in this agenda of life. It's not so much about your mission. It's not so much about what you want. It's about what God wants through you. I want everyone in this room, everyone in this conversation, to see what God can do through you. Because God can do exceedingly and abundantly above all you can even ask or think in your life. If you attune yourself to your, His will. Matter of fact, when you attune yourself to God's will, then God will make sure what you want is accomplished. Amen. Psalm 37 says it clearly. Commit your way to the Lord, and your thoughts will be established. Yeah, yeah somebody's thoughts is going to be established because your will is attached to the will of God. Amen. You may be perplexed. You may be in the corner of life, and you feel as if you're, you're marginalized, and people have overlooked you. God says, even though you may feel perplexed, even though you may feel confused, even though you may feel battered down, God is still watching over you. He's watching over your way, your goonies and goings, your ins and outs. God's looking over your books. God's looking over your finances. God is looking over your family. God is looking over your ways. Because God has a future for you. Just like the psalm says, we've got to give ourselves away to God so God can use us. Because if we don't let God use us, we're bound to let other people use us. Right. Some of y'all wish I had some people and witnesses in the house, and you're done with letting people use you and abuse you. Right. You're done with people trying to manipulate you. Right. We need God to use you. Right. And this morning, I just want to serve notice to you. I want to serve notice to your circles. Serve notice to your agenda. Because you will never have happiness. Until you find it in God. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The Bible doesn't declare, declare this arbitrarily. It says that blessed is the one who walks not in the way of sinners, or the seat of the scoffers, or takes the path of those who are in the scornful group. Yeah. You've got to be aligning yourself to the right village. I believe if you have a visitor in the house, you've been looking for a village. You've been looking for someone to make you feel as if God is in your corner. You've been trying to fill a void. God says, once you fill it, the proper thing, you will never thirst again. Because you'll be like one planted by the streams of water. Not wanting anything. We stand to the field of the building. We can at this time as we offer the invitation, as we offer prayer, as we advocate to the throne of grace and mercy on your behalf. If you're someone today that's visiting with us, we want to teach you. We want to impact your life. We want to meet and connect with you. We want to teach you the way of the blessed life. And even at this time, as you're standing to your feet, many of you have prayer requests. Maybe not for yourself, but for your neighbor. Maybe not for your neighbor, but maybe for a family member that couldn't be here today. I want you to begin to think about that person in your single wide imagination. I want you to begin to pray for your neighbor in your heart today. I want you to begin to search your heart and ask God if there's any other way that is not of God to take it away. As we bow eyes and close, we go to God in prayer. Father God. We know that the blessed life, the happy life, is only found in you. We can't rely on our pride. We can't rely on our own strength. But what we can do is look up to you. We've tried the hills. We've tried 
systems of the world. We try our own desire, but God, that leaves us still wanting. We need your resource, and we need your source that will continue to bless us in this journey. Father God, I pray for every individual who is under attack by the enemy, under the sound of my voice in this sanctuary, and those watching in the virtual vessel, I pray, God, that you will protect them, watch over their ways, and fulfill your promise toward them. You know the ways for them, the plans that you have for them. Father God, those who are sick and hurting right now, I pray that you will heal them in a powerful way. A way that is not of themselves. Where they have to say, God, you did it and I didn't do anything because I couldn't contribute to this glory. That your glory is so obvious that we have to give you praise and worship. Not that we think it's from us, but, but we think that it's only coming from you. God, I pray for those people who are traveling, that they have safety. But right now, Father God, I pray for those under the sound of my voice, that you will give them durability, productivity. Here it is, stability. Father God, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. Hello, church family. We've come to the communion portion of our service. In Matthew 26, verse 26, it says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let us go in prayer. Dear gracious and heavenly Father, we just thank you for all the many blessings and the daily bread you give to us. At this time, we just recognize the bread bread that symbolizes your body broken for us so we may have life and life everlasting. And this cup which symbolizes your blood, blood shed for us that our many sins may be forgiven. We do this in remembrance of ye. Now at this time you may take your communion. God bless. Good morning, everyone. We have now come to the portion of our service which is set aside for us to be able to give back to the church. God uses our giving as an investment where everyone gets a return. If we are blessed beyond our needs, it is not for the purpose of living more lavishly, but instead, it is used for to be able to give back to others. So as God continues to bless us, let us continue to remember to give back to him and to give back to those and bless those who are in need. In Malachi 3, verse 10, it reads, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. And prove me now where herewith, said the Lord of hosts, if I would not open you the windows of heaven and pour out you out a blessing, that there shall be not room enough to receive it. At Sheldon Heights, we offer three ways that you may give back to the Lord. One, you may use our electronic giving, which is called Give Plus. Secondly, you may drop off at the annex to one of the administrators who will be present there. And thirdly, you may mail your contribution to 11355 South Halsted. Let us go to our Father in prayer at this time. Our Father and God, we want to thank you for all you have done for us at this time. Father, we want to thank you for keeping us safe and allowing us to be, see another day in this world. Father, we want to continue to ask you to bless those who are in need and ask us and remind us that it is our responsibility to support them and most of all to support you. 
these blessings and many more we ask in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.